on, on behalf of the United Nations Development Program, thank you very much for coming in for this uh, panel discussion. And as you know, uh, the 19th Amendment of the Constitution was approved by Parliament on the 28th of April uh, by a vast majority of that uh, legislation and came into operation on the 15th of May, uh, that was last Friday. Um, discussions around issues relating to the 19th Amendment, such as the abolition or pruning of powers of the executive presidency, strengthening the independence of oversight bodies or commissions, have taken place for many years now uh, and gained momentum during and after the presidential election in January. We have today three panelists uh, who have generously agreed to flag some of the issues underlying the adoption of the 19th Amendment as well as share their analysis and perspectives of whether the amendment has met expectations of different segments of society and the best interests of the state overall. Despite social political efforts leading to the adoption of the 19th Amendment, statements have been made to the effect that our current constitution needs a total overhaul and that attempts to introduce a new constitution need to be resuscitated. So it is in this background that we thought of holding this panel discussion to inform ourselves of what has changed in the overall governance framework of Sri Lanka as well as what lessons can be flagged for future governance reform processes. Uh, some of the key questions which arise are uh, what implications does the 19th Amendment have for the power configuration between the President and Parliament, as well as between the President and the Prime Minister, for instance? How effective will the Constitutional Council be in protecting the independence of oversight bodies or the commissions? Is it vulnerable to political snacks, as was experienced under the 17th Amendment of the Constitution. Other questions are, what is the impact of the amendment in protecting oversight functions and creating a check and balance on executive powers in areas such as elections, public service, police, audit, finance, national procurement, and human rights. I hope that there will also be opportunity for the panelists' assessment of what, are, what is the fundamental right to information as introduced by the 19th Amendment. How does that compare to recognition of this right in international conventions, uh, which Sri Lanka is a party to, or you know, compared to other jurisdictions? Also, importantly, what was the process followed in drafting and adoption of the 19th Amendment? Um, did it look at issues of participation, inclusion, and transparency? And how can lessons from future, uh, how, how can lessons learned from this process inform future constitutional reform processes? So to answer some of these questions, we have with us three panelists. Uh, Dr. Jayanpati Vikramatna, who is President's Counsel and who is a uh, here as a, as a panelist in his personal capacity, uh, Mr. Manohar De Silva, President's Counsel, and Mr. Rohan Idrisingha, Visiting Lecturer of the Law Faculty of the University of Colombo. In terms of the structure of the panel, um, each panelist will take 15 to 20 minutes to provide some introductory observations and remarks, uh, followed by a question and answer session of about 45 minutes. And then we'll have concluding remarks by each of the panelists. Um, to wind up. So I will hand over now to Dr. Vikram Rakhna uh, to start off the panel. Thank you, Sonali. My fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, thankful to the UNDP for inviting me uh, to this panel discussion on the 19th Amendment, uh, and also about lessons for the future, which includes possible constitutional reform in the future. I, I, mean, I was involved, I mean, all of you know, all of you know that I was involved in the drafting of the 19th Amendment. I happen to be the senior advisor to the Brazilian on Constitutional Affairs, but I want to make it, make it clear, clarify that I'm here in my personal capacity. Uh, 
the abolition of the executive presidency and uh, the bringing back of the 917th amendment, so to say, uh, constituted two of the main pillars of the social movement that grew up during the last few years. But in time, time, time to come, I mean, the, the, although, although many who wanted a common candidate from the opposition, uh, that, that they wanted total abolition of the executive presidency, with other political forces, other forces coming into the broad coalition that we uh, managed to get together. There was no there was no unanimity on abolition. There were certain parties who thought that some of the powers of the president should be taken away and not and and that the presidency should not itself be abolished. There were also some parties who thought that any constitutional reform at this stage should not involve a referendum. And one of the reasons given was that that there would be election fatigue, in the sense that there would be three national elections, a presidential election, a parliamentary election to, in the same year, and also a referendum. Uh, some thought that would be too much. So finally, it was agreed between the parties that came together that a referendum would be avoided, that some of the, that the president would retain certain powers, some powers, uh, that the, the method of election of the president would not be touched during this stage. So we started off have with constraint imposed on us. The manifesto, the election manifesto spoke about the replacement of the of the, 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 uh, the uh, executive presidency with the cabinet form of government. Allied, the words used for, I don't think it was a good translation, but the words used for allied to parliament. Then there was also the other constraint that the, 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 the present parliament was elected in 2010. It was basically a pro Raja Paksa parliament. And there was this huge difficulty of getting a two thirds majority. That was also considered. After the election, well, uh, uh, one of the main issues that arose in the election, of course, was the issue of the executive presidency. You could see that even from the uh, same platform, different views were expressed. People in the UN, the International Party, and people in the left would talk about the abolition of the executive presidency, whereas others would talk about taking away the powers of the executive presidency. So, uh, well, that reflected the the the, the, the real uh, the situation among the uh, parties that uh, came together to support the common candidate. So after the election, as regards process, I must say a few words because much has been said about but there has been some criticism, some of them quite valid. What happened was that, well, if, even before the election, some of us had done, an, done a draft with the help of uh, some of the best legal draftsmen that we have in Sri Lanka. Uh, we had done a draft, but of course that had to be changed in to make it live with the election manifesto. After the election with the formation of the new cabinet, 
Mr. Ryan Vikramasinghe became, became the minister in charge of the subject of constitutional affairs, although he was never described as a minister of constitutional affairs, but the subject of constitutional affairs came under him. And a uh, political committee, why we call it a political committee, of representatives of political parties in the government, as well as parties sitting in the opposition but supportive of the, the changes that were promised by the common candidate was set up. And there was a small drafting team of which I was a member. And uh, so decisions regarding the drafting was all taken by that, by that committee. That committee met uh, almost weekly, sometimes twice a week. And that is how the drafting went. Uh, as regards public consultations, I must say that there was not much of public consultation. And that has to be admitted. Of course, the whole issue of the uh, abolition or the pruning of the expulsion, exigency, whatever you call it, has, was one of the main issues. Close to that, to that extent, there was public discussion during the election. But I must concede that there were formal uh, calling, of, calling for whips on the public. Although we did get a large number of representations. And I must tell you that I myself went through each of the letters each and every one of the letters that were received. And some had actually made, some people had made some very good suggestions. Then the matter went to the cabinet. The draft that went to the cabinet, uh, from my perspective, it was much progressive than what was finally gazetted. But then the issue of whether, of how to get the truth as majority, to the, because the government was a minority government. At that time, at the initial stages, when it was passed by the cabinet, it did not have even a simple majority in parliament. Thereafter, of course, people from Sri Lanka Freedom Party joined the government. It was not clear, still not, not clear whether we had a majority in parliament, even a simple majority. Uh, then the issue of this uh, of, a, of, of getting the Buddhist majority was discussed, and discussions were held with the opposition parties. And uh, the opposition parties, including the Sri Lanka Freedom Party, uh, part of it was in the opposition, were not for uh, complete abolition, of course, but they also wanted more dilution of the uh, provisions. That, that, that they, they, they were for the retention of more powers by the president. And therefore, it was decided to gazette the bill, the, the, the bill that was finally examined by the Supreme Court, but therefore a much diluted version. But it was also decided at the cabinet that, that within a week or so, the president and the prime minister would sit down and uh, discuss these outstanding issues and come to an understanding. And with that they did. And uh, it was on that basis that more amendments were published, not published, they were presented to the Supreme Court, the Constitution and the, the amendments to the 19th Amendment, which were to be presented to Parliament during the committee stage were raised before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court did consider them also, but of course in the judgment, in the determination, there is no reference to any of those uh, uh, amendments. Now I come to the uh, determination of the Supreme Court. One of the main issues that was raised, uh, one of the main issues that were raised by uh, petitioners to oppose the bill was that we, that we have uh, we have an, a basic structure that the basic structure of the constitution uh, is uh, uh, included the uh, discretion the final discretion authority of the president to make decisions regarding executive governance and therefore that it violates the basic structure of the constitution it was claimed by the petitioners that if the executive power is if executive power is alienated from the president, that very active, the very act of alienation or transfer of executive power uh, would violate Article 3 of the Constitution. Uh, Article 3 of the Constitution, as you know, uh, says that in the Republic of Sri Lanka, sovereignty is in the people and it is inalienable. Sovereignty includes the powers of government, fundamental rights and franchise. It is Article 4 that goes into detail. Uh, 
There has been discussion over the years whether Article 4 must necessarily be read with Article 3. In the 13th Amendment case, five of the nine, nine judges, that was a full bench case, five of the nine, five, five out of the nine judges uh, went into the history of Article 4. Article 4 had been included in the uh, list of articles that in, in Article 83. Article 83 gives a list of provisions and requires any <coughs> amendment that violates any of those provisions, those specified provisions, that it would require not only a two-thirds majority but also uh, approval by the people at a referendum. Uh, article 4 had been in the, in art, Article 4 had been listed in Article 3 at the bill stage, but in the committee stage it had been deleted. We find in the final constitution, Article 4 is not in the in that list. And the Supreme Court in the 13th Amendment case took note of the legislative history of Article 4 and held that that not every inconsistency with Article 3, 4 rather, would necessarily violate Article 3. And they had only Article 3 would be violated only if there was prejudicial impact on the sovereignty of the people. The, the Supreme Court in the 19th Amendment, in this 19th, there were two, there were two 19th Amendment cases, one in 2001 or 2002, I believe, uh, which was also examined by a bench of nine uh, judges. The Supreme Court now held that Article 4 would necessarily, not all violations of Article 4 would necessarily result in violation of Article 3. It was also held that the, uh, that the, this is important, that the Constitution did not intend the President to function as an unfettered repository of executive power, unconstrained by other organs of government. Uh, that the President is not the sole repository of executive power under the Constitution. As far as, I don't want to go into details, but as far as individual articles were concerned, now there was a change, there was this new proviso, pro, pro, provision rather, which provided for the President to appoint as ministers members of parliament on the advice of the Prime Minister. Now the court did not strike it down. The, it said that executive power should not be identified with the president and personalized and should not be identified at all times at the power of the people. And the, the key sentence is, though Article 4 provides the form and manner of excess of the power to the people, the ultimate act or decision of his executive power functions must be retained by the president. So the court held either the final act must be that of the president or the decision must be by the, of the president. So even if the prime minister advises the president on the, in the matter of as to, as to who the ministers are, the final act being, the, being that of the president, that would not violate Article 3. So long as the president remains head of the executive, the power executive the exercise of powers remain supreme and sovereign in the executive field. And there is also this other sentence which says, the president must be in a position to monitor or give directions to others who derive authority from the president. So either monitor, not necessarily the final authority. If he is in a position to monitor, of course when there is, when advice is given, there would necessarily be a, a process of consultation. Although the Prime Minister, the President would finally have to act on the advice of the President or of the, of the Prime Minister in the matter of some the ministers, there would of course that there, there would of course a uh, process of discussion. So uh, I think my own view is that this judgment opens the door for further constitutional reform, for further dilution of the President's power powers without holding a referendum. Complete abolition, of course, may very well require a referendum. Uh, but to take away further powers at the next stage of constitutional reform, and I hope there will be one very soon, 
uh, referendum would not be necessary. But of course, if a, 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 a new constitution is to be uh, brought in, it is best that the constitution, that particular constitution, should be placed before the people at a referendum. Therefore, then, then of course, the question of inconsistency with Article 3 does not would not arise because in any case the constitution draft the, the bills will be uh, placed before the people at a referendum. Uh, the other difficulty was that, as I said earlier, of course this was basically a pro Rajapaksa parliament. Uh, so, if I am asked whether I am satisfied with the bill, the 19th amendment that was passed finally, I would say no. But I would, I, I think it's a B plus, 65 percent, or a B plus. I would have been happy with an A. I wouldn't have expected an A plus, certainly not. Not with, not with the present composition of the parliament, but I'm disappointed that we did not make it uh, make it A minus or, or, or A. Uh, now, what were the powers? And I, I would like to compare this situation with the one that existed between the period of between the period 2001 to 2005, when Chandika Bandar the CBK was President and Ryan Vikram Singh of RW was, was Prime Minister. Now, the, the President at that time, in the first two and a half years or so, was seen as a kind of a lame dark president, couldn't do anything, wouldn't, he, wouldn't, wouldn't even, who was not even able to uh, take over, I think, the development lottery when she wanted. She couldn't even get the asset printer. But she waited for a bit of a time and, and then struck because there was the power of dissolution. She had the power of dissolution, she had the power of the president had the power of dissolution of parliament, the also the power of, of, of removing ministers and appointing any minister at her will. Now, compared to that, we have a situation where the president cannot dissolve parliament for four and a half years. The president cannot appoint, although the president can remove ministers, he cannot appoint ministers except on the advice. The president won't have this president does not have the, does not have the immunity that the president that that he had earlier under Article 35. It's restricted. Then the Constitution is council the uh, process is more stronger. Uh, and there are more commissions, like for example even the United even the University of Jazz Commission, the Official Languages Commission, various other commissions have been brought uh, under the appointment process of the Constitutional Council. Uh, so I think there is, of course, the rational quite right to mention. There was this issue of there is this issue of dual power. It may not arise during the presidency of 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 uh, uh, Citizen, but it may well arise under uh, uh, in the future. Uh, the issue of dual power with the prime minister and parliament also having uh, much powers than before, and the president also retaining certain powers. So, speaking for myself, I am for total abolition, so that this issue of dual power uh, would not arise. Uh, as regards the new constitution, I am for a brand new constitution, of course, with a uh, new Bill of Rights, uh, constitutional settlement of the national question, judicial reform, post enactment judicial review, very important. We now managed to get urgent views out of the way. Uh, I think this must be followed by uh, by uh, post enactment judicial review of legislation. As far as, but still we have to go through, the, uh, for constitutional reform, we still have the problem of the two-thirds majority. Uh, it appears now that, I think one is almost certain, I think I am all, all, almost certain that the next government will be one of the government of national unity. And if I think it will be the, the party of the president and the party of the present prime minister will be the key uh, partners in, 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 a, in a future government. And together they might very well uh, command with the support of other parties, command to this majority. Okay, that's my my own assessment and my, 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 my wish too. And uh, therefore, I think as as people who are interested in constitutional reform, 
you should now ask the party, now there is a, there is definitely an election coming, whether it's July, August, or post September, and the party is not known. But we must, I think we must not pressurize the parties to take clear positions on constitution. Very clear position on, on constitution reform, whether they want a new constitution or not, whether they want to tinker with the constitution or even and, and uh, what they would uh, what they stand for, so that the people would know where would would, would, would know where it, that there is that every party takes a clear position, so that the people know the position of each party when they vote for a new parliament. And the other issue of uh, on this issue of the constitu uh, new constitution, uh, the issue of a possible constituent assembly has also been raised. Uh, as far as the constituent assembly outside the process of amendment of the constitution, as laid down in the constitution is concerned, that's a that's a very serious issue. I was I, I was a very I, I have been a I was once a, a great supporter of the 1972 constitution and the process that was followed uh, the, uh, the extra constitutional process. Uh, but today I have different views. Well, I think in, some, in certain disparate situations, country may have to go the external, the go uh, take the take the, uh, the, the uh, take the other route, go through a constitution assembly process this, without following the uh, process that is set out in the present constitution. But if you follow the process that was followed in 1970-1972, I, I would not certainly want to go back to such a process. Because I have no problem with that constituent assembly because all the parties of the setting of the constituent assembly, because all the parties in parliament got together to set up the constituent assembly. They all came for the first meeting. But as far but but regarding the procedure that was followed, it was, it was basically a united front driven constitution constitution. Uh, well, we have now lessons from South Africa. Of course, South Africa is a completely different kind of fish. But where, where there was no, where two thirds majority was not required, but there was this formula of a sufficient consensus. That although there is no two thirds majority, even when there is no two thirds majority, there were two judges, I think they came from abroad, and uh, they had to certify that there was a sufficient consensus. So I'm a little wary of, of using the constituent uh, assembly route outside the present constitution. Uh, although I understand, I mean, I understand the difficulties that we would have to we have to face in uh, drawing up a new constitution because it is very it is essential. What happened to the constitution? The constitution did not survive six years. It did not survive six years, and I think the the the, the method of the method of adoption of the 1972 constitution also. Uh, contributed to that because uh, the United National Party did not uh, finally vote for it. The Tamil parties uh, did not. Uh, they walked out. Half, uh, they, they discontinued. They have, uh, there was no, no walkout as such, but they discontinued participation at one time. So it was basically a United Front Constitution, as much as the present Constitution is basically a JR Jayavadan Constitution. Uh, so as far as lessons are concerned. I think uh, I think we did well, given the fact that we did not have a not even have a simple majority. I think we did well, I, and uh, it was the coalition that got together made it that made it possible. Uh, even without a even without, we started off with the same without a simple majority, but finally managed to get the two-thirds majority that was required. Of course, we had to compromise. Especially on the Congress, on the Constitutional Council, and other issues, we had to compromise. We were not, we were not, we were not, not very happy. And all great to uh, President Maitri uh, Palasikisena for leading this process. Uh, people who, I mean, people, in, I come from the left, as most of you would know, and even the left, leaders of the left parties who had been, who have, who were, who were, who were right throughout for the abolition of the executive presidency at the election said, well, no one would abolish this executive presidency. No one who, because I, it was, I think, of course, that was an excuse to support Mr. Ayurvax, but uh, they took out the position that they, nobody would give up these powers. But finally, 
we, we are happy that the process was led by the president who agreed to who, who, who agreed to give up powers. And I was told about a certain loyal, loyal member of parliament who went and told the prime minister, to the president, uh, Mr. President, uh, I'll say that in Sinhalese, Mr. President, what the UNP is trying to do is to take away all your powers. And the President is supposed to have replied, uh, <laughs> uh, Member of Parliament, what are you also want? I want to give a, I want to give up my powers. So we have now a president who I mean who has who has shown by who has led by, by, by example. And I think uh, there is a very good, there are good pros prospects of constitutional reform in the in the future. And uh, well, of course, without such hopes, you can't go ahead. Uh, so I look forward to further constitutional reform, if possible, a new constitution in the uh, in the in the months to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vikramathna. Essentially, uh, Dr. Vikramathna spoke about some of the political constraints faced during the leading up to the adoption of the 19th Amendment, as well as uh, some deficiencies in the process in terms of formal consultation processes. Um, he also sort of provided a, a clear position in terms of what he wants uh, in the future in terms of a new constitution, a new bill of rights, uh, also the inclusion of post-enactment uh, review of uh, judicial review of legislation. Um, and also, I think he made a good point in that uh, before the, the next general elections that the political parties should take a clear position on where they stand uh, on, on issues like uh, the executive presidency and, and parliamentary supremacy. Um, and then he also expressed some concerns about setting up something like a constituent assembly going forward in, in the current uh, political context. Uh, so thank you very much for that. And